This novel was possible because of a Patreon member request. So if you want to support this channel you can consider becoming a Patreon member to make the request like this. Or you can support this channel on PayPal or Ko-fi link in the description. And if you want to buy Google Drive link which has more than 300 plus novel audiobook then you can visit my Ko-fi account. Where you will get Google Drive link in just $20 for lifetime. Also, if you want to read an advanced chapter or want to support the author of this novel then you can support the author. Link in description. Chapter 1. Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. Looking at his intact reflection in the mirror, the man pinched his own face to confirm that he wasn't dreaming. Bewildered, he exclaimed, holy crap, am I alive? Did I really time travel? His name was Bai Song, unrelated to his father's gaming skills. It was mainly because his mother's surname was Song, so he happily decided to be called Bai Song. Just about 10 minutes ago, Bai Song woke up early in the morning, only to realize it was already 1 p.m. As usual, after lazing around at home for half an hour, he prepared to go out and buy breakfast. However, as he was about to cross the road to the noodle shop across the street, suddenly, a truck loaded with goods suddenly accelerated and crashed into him. It was hard not to suspect it was intentional. But one thing was certain, Bai Song was completely wrecked by the crash, and it was only a matter of time before he met his end. Just when Bai Song was about to meet his demise, a floating panel appeared before his eyes. He didn't remember the exact words written on it, something about saving the world or whatever. In simple terms, it gave him two options, either come back to life and work or perish on the spot. Given the circumstances, was there even a need to consider? Bai Song resolutely chose the former. After coming back to his senses, he found himself in a house that didn't belong to him, as the homeowner was absent. Who owned the house wasn't important. What mattered was that his body, previously crushed and suffering from multiple fractures, was now completely unharmed, as if he had never encountered the accident. To be honest, Bai Song still had a sense of unreality even at this moment. So, I really arrived in the type moon world. After digesting the information implanted in his mind, Bai Song finally understood his current situation. In simple terms, this world was sick, and he was brought here to save it from being screwed. Although, what exactly was going on wasn't explained at all, which gave Bai Song the illusion that he was just cannon fodder. Nevertheless, the thing that brought him here didn't go all the way with the bad stuff. At the very least, it granted him the ability to summon servants, allowing him to possess some self-defense power, preventing him from being completely useless. Collecting himself, Bai Song tentatively asked, Interface. As soon as he finished speaking, a floating display screen appeared immediately before Bai Song's eyes, roughly estimated to be around 27 inches. On the left side were several prominent buttons, but only two were lit up, target and summon. The rest were gray and unavailable, likely to be unlocked later. After giving it some thought, Bai Song didn't rush to look at the summoning interface but instead clicked on the first button, the target button. Objective 1, Summon Servant 0 1. Objective 2, Looking at these two lonely lines of text, Bai Song silently exited this interface and shifted his gaze to the summoning button. In the instant he clicked it, the panel disappeared right before Bai Song's eyes. In its place, a rapidly forming crimson summoning circle appeared before Bai Song, not resembling the summoning circle for summoning servants in the type moon world, but being exactly the same. Speaking of which, what was the summoning chant? Well, it seems I don't need it. As Bai Song looked at this crimson summoning circle, before he could come up with a summoning chant in his mind, the summoning circle spontaneously activated, without Bai Song needing to manually operate anything. As the summoning circle ran automatically, each line of the circle started emitting a faint blue light, becoming increasingly dazzling. Finally, the summoning circle dimmed for a moment, and then the center of the circle seemed to explode, releasing an extremely dazzling white light. The intensity of the light was such that Bai Song, who was observing the entire summoning process, was caught off guard and was blinded, as if he were intensely focused on sniping an opponent, and a teammate had thrown a flashbang grenade in his face, leaving him completely dazzled. Even though Bai Song immediately placed his right hand in front of his eyes in an attempt to block the light, he was a little too late. After about two to three seconds, as the intensity of the light gradually subsided, Bai Song's vision slowly began to recover. At the same time, three blood red lines appeared on his right hand, forming the command seals. Meanwhile, in the summoning circle, a blurry figure had already appeared. It was undoubtedly the servant Bai Song had just summoned. However, this servant, seemed a little too short? A rough estimate would suggest that it might not even reach one meter in height, and its appearance was somewhat peculiar. Bai Song rubbed his eyes and took a careful look at the servant he had summoned, and then, he froze. In the middle of the summoning circle stood a grey-blue giant cat, holding a golden trophy in its hands, proudly raising its head. The trophy was inscribed with the words National Mouse Catching Champion, Tom. Tom. Tom Tom Tom. Tom. After being in a daze for a while, Bai Song finally reacted, looking at the grey-blue giant cat before him with an incredulous expression. Seeing that Bai Song seemed to know its name, Tom, still holding the trophy, nodded vigorously, confirming Bai Song's recognition. At the same time, its expression grew even more proud. Oh my gosh. It's really Tom. After the daze, a surge of excitement immediately rose from within Bai Song's heart. Yes. Let's not talk about anything else, but at least his survival was guaranteed. 
Earlier, he was thinking that it was 1994 here, probably during the Fourth Holy Grail War. If he didn't summon a top-tier or even higher-ranked servant, he would not only fail to save the world, but his own existence would be hanging by a thread. And then, he summoned Tom, the comedic character. As everyone knows, no matter how powerful you are, you should never engage in a battle of wits with a comedic character. Just look at Alilei who randomly appeared in the Dragon Ball world, it's simply terrifying. Kuso Kuso Ka. Just as Bai Song was still rejoicing, a sound of picking locks came from the door. Creak. With a small noise, the person outside managed to open the door and caught a glimpse of Bai Song across from them. Their eyes met, and eventually, the person at the door spoke first. Hey, you're the owner of this house, right? I'm Ryan Ashuk. Sorry for the intrusion. Before Ryan Ashuk could finish speaking, Bai Song immediately recognized who was standing before him upon hearing the name. He hastily pointed at Ryan Ashuk and shouted, Tom, capture him for me. Chapter 2, Tom's First Battle? Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. Upon hearing Bai Song's command, Ryan Ashuk couldn't help but pause, sensing that something was off. Normally, when someone catches another person picking their lock, the first reaction would be to ask, who are you, and then demand them to leave or call the police immediately, right? Usually, that's how it should go. But this time, something seemed a bit off. Could it be a colleague? But there were no signs of the lock being tampered with before. Meanwhile, Ryan Ashuk quickly assessed the situation at hand. On the other side, when Tom heard Bai Song ordering him to tie up the man in front of him, he couldn't help but point at himself, then at the man who was nearly three times his height, as if saying, are you sure my small frame can handle him? However, Bai Song didn't say anything. He simply gave Tom a confident thumbs up. Upon receiving Bai Song's affirmation, Tom swallowed nervously. Though he felt a tad bit anxious, he immediately tossed aside his trophy for being the national rat catching champion. Then, he reached behind his back and pulled out a rope from seemingly nowhere. With his left hand holding the end of the rope, Tom started swinging the lasso in his right hand, gradually increasing the speed until it created after images. Huh? Are you having this cat attack me? Ha ha ha. Wait a minute, this thing is a cat. Just as Ryan Ashuk was mocking him halfway, he looked at Tom's subsequent actions and was immediately dumbfounded as he watched Tom swinging the rope. Once the rope reached the appropriate speed, Tom flung it towards Ryan Ashuk. To everyone's surprise, the rope that had originally been only one meter long in Tom's hand kept extending, defying the laws of physics, and flew directly towards Ryan Ashuk, who was six meters away. Although Ryan Ashuk couldn't comprehend this maneuver at all, he still instinctively dodged. He easily sidestepped the lasso that Tom had just thrown, finding it quite effortless. However, before Ryan Ashuk could even catch his breath, his pupils suddenly contracted. The lasso, because it missed its target, remained suspended in the air, as if the laws of gravity didn't exist on this planet. Then, something even more hair-raising occurred. The lasso stayed still in the spot where Ryan Ashuk had been standing less than two seconds ago, but immediately made a sharp turn towards his current position, as if it were a tracking missile more precise than an actual guided missile. Oh no. At this moment, Ryan Ashuk realized it was too late to dodge. Inertia took over, causing him to experience a brief moment of paralysis. And in that split second, the lasso skillfully and accurately looped around his head, capturing his entire body, including his hands, in its grip. But it didn't end there. The rope, after ensnaring Ryan Ashuk, began rapidly and eerily wrapping itself around him in a bizarre manner. Finally, after tying itself into a butterfly knot, the rope stopped its seemingly anti-physics movement that could pierce through Newton's coffin board. Ryan Ashuk, on the other hand, was completely bound like a rice dumpling. His entire body was almost immobile, with only his lower legs able to move slightly. Ryan Ashuk couldn't fathom this supernatural scene. The rope that had been just one meter long when thrown, how could it have bound him up like this? Nice job, Tom. Well done. Bai Song exclaimed excitedly upon seeing Tom effortlessly subdue Ryan Ashuk. However, before he could finish his praise, a slight change occurred on the scene. Ryan Ashuk, faced with the inexplicable situation, instinctively took half a step back. It was this small movement that caused Tom, who tightly gripped the rope, to be pulled toward Ryan Ashuk by a full meter. In fact, Tom's breaking, no, cat breaking, left two one meter long grooves on the wooden floor. It was only when Tom was pulled to the hallway connecting the entrance and the living room, using his feet to anchor himself to the sides of the doorway, that he managed to stop being pulled by Ryan Ashuk. Not only Bai Song was stunned, but Ryan Ashuk couldn't believe his eyes as he looked at Tom, who had been pulled over a meter by his own doing, and the two one meter long grooves under his feet. Ryan Ashuk had only taken half a step back, a mere 10 centimeters. Huh? Am I really this strong? The moment Ryan Ashuk realized that he might be able to defeat the cat easily, his confidence skyrocketed? Following the same retreat he had just done, Ryan Ashuk attempted to take another step back. Just like before, even though Tom's feet were already braced against the wall, trying to hold on to him, Ryan Ashuk felt no resistance at all. It was to the extent that he could confidently call Tom weak. Once he confirmed this again, Ryan Ashuk's confidence returned completely. He now understood that despite the oddity of the blue upright cat named Tom in front of him, his fighting ability far surpassed it. If he could just pull Tom towards him, a headbutt would undoubtedly end the battle. On the other hand, 
Tom was once again pulled by a full meter towards Ryunashuk, but this time, only his body moved closer by a meter, while his feet remained securely braced against the corridor's exit. At this point, there was only about two meters of distance between Ryunashuk and Tom. As long as Ryunashuk took one more step back, Tom would fall within the range of his headbutt attack. In this crucial moment, Tom released his right hand and casually pulled out a big stick that was as thick and long as a wrist. Although Ryunashuk was a bit puzzled about where Tom had gotten such a big stick, he remained unfazed. With Tom's limited strength, even if he struck himself, it would be no different from a baby's punch. Moreover, Ryunashuk would end the battle with a headbutt before Tom could attack. So, with utmost confidence, Ryunashuk took the final half step back. With this step, he and Tom finally came face to face, less than half a meter apart. It can be said with certainty that when two males are in such close proximity, it can only result in one of two things, either a fight or a surrender. At this moment, Ryunashuk and Tom, two males, were like the quick-drawing gunslingers in a western standoff. After a brief stalemate, they both made their moves simultaneously, Ryunashuk exerted force with his legs, tilting his body downward, fully prepared for a powerful headbutt. However, at that moment, he noticed that Tom didn't swing his big stick, but instead held it suspended about 10 centimeters above his own head. This made Ryunashuk's movement hesitate for a moment, wondering if Tom had given up on the attack. Just as Ryunashuk was thinking this, Tom kept his wrist steady and simply lowered the big stick with his hand, striking Ryunashuk on the head. Boom. Chapter 3, Battle Ends. Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. With a loud bang, the big stick accurately struck Ryunashuk's head. The impact caused Ryunashuk's legs to kick up, leaving him straight as a rod. He floated in the air for about 20 centimeters, as if suspended in midair. After five seconds, as if remembering to save face for Newton, Ryunashuk fell to the ground with a thud, unconscious due to the physical impact, looking peaceful. At the same time, a fist-sized lump quickly formed on Ryunashuk's forehead, with golden stars even popping out of the lump. Well, well done, Tom, Baisong said as he watched the events unfold. He swallowed his saliva and tremblingly rubbed Tom's head with his right hand. Although Baisong had known that comedic characters had extraordinary strength in serious anime, actually witnessing it made him feel absurd beyond belief. It was absurd to the point of being utterly ridiculous and unfathomable. Unlike Ryunashuk, at least Baisong had a slight psychological preparation. Compared to Ryunashuk's horrified expression when facing supernatural creatures, Baisong's situation was much better. Feeling Baisong rubbing his head, Tom casually tossed the wooden stick in his hand to the side and affectionately nuzzled Baisong's palm, completely unaware that his recent actions had left his new owner, Baisong, stunned for a moment. Anyway, let's drink to celebrate. Baisong looked at the devastated corridor and Ryunashuk, who was tightly bound and lying in the middle of the hallway, and decisively chose to escape. It would be troublesome if the owner of this house suddenly returned. As for Ryunashuk, killing him was impossible. Bai Song remembered very clearly that in the original story, Ryunashuk's criminal methods were quite clever, and no one had ever suspected him. He wasn't even listed as a suspect. Reporting to the police would be like giving the tiger back to the mountain. So the best solution was to find a place where nobody knew and dispose of him, or sink him into Dong Mubei. Upon hearing Bai Song's new request, Tom nodded eagerly, with such a large range of motion that Bai Song worried his brain might get shaken up. Then Tom reached behind his back and pulled out a bag about the same size as himself from his buttocks, intending to put Ryunashuk into it. For Tom, it was his first time here, and he had to show off in front of his new owner. He couldn't reveal his lazy dog nature, at least not now. He had to make sure his new owner understood that he was an extraordinary champion cat. Just as Tom was about to use a small bag that could barely fit a chicken to put Ryuanosuk in, Bai Song seemed to remember something and quickly stopped Tom, saying, Wait a minute. Bai Song hurried over to Ryuanosuk's side and struggled to untie the rope in the middle. He reached into Ryuanosuk's pocket and pulled out a wallet. As the saying goes, money isn't everything, but without money, you're in big trouble. Bai Song urgently needed some startup capital, and getting it from this killer was the best choice. It was convenient, and White Song wouldn't feel any guilt for robbing him. Tom, you can continue, said Bai Song. After hearing Bai Song's permission, Tom stepped forward again and effortlessly squeezed Ryuanosuk into a bag that was just about the same size as him. The surprising thing was that even after Tom stuffed Ryuanosuk in, there was still plenty of space left in the linen bag. The bag was loose and floppy, like a baggy cloud. Leaving the room like this wouldn't attract attention, obviously. After Tom put Ryuanosuk in, he used a rope he found somewhere to seal the bag. He casually slung the bag over his shoulder but ended up throwing himself to the ground, probably because he swung it too forcefully. Watching this comical scene, Bai Song almost burst out laughing. Maybe I should do it instead. Feeling that Bai Song might be looking down on him, Tom, who had just found a new owner, didn't want to be underestimated. He thought that if his new owner ended up getting a mechanical cat or something, it would be a disaster. So, with a serious face, Tom decisively extended his hand toward Bai Song, rejecting his proposal. Tom rolled up his sleeve, spat on his hands twice, and then grabbed the bag again. He lifted it forcefully and slung it over his shoulder. Then, with a confident look, Tom turned to Bai Song, as if waiting for his praise. White Song was still absorbed in Tom's recent actions. 
Who knew how Tom managed to roll up the fur on his arm like a sleeve? After snapping out of it, Bai Song saw Tom looking at him with expectant eyes. Bai Song had to snap out of his thoughts and encourage him, saying, Impressive, Tom. I'll treat you to something delicious later. As soon as Tom heard about food, his enthusiasm skyrocketed to the point where it was almost tangible. His eyes seemed to turn into a slot machine, quickly flashing through several symbols before settling on a large chicken leg. Let's go, said Bai Song. And so, side by side, the two of them walked out of the house. However, just as Bai Song absentmindedly closed the door, he suddenly remembered that there was another cat next to him. But it was too late. In the instant the door closed, it decisively caught Tom's tail, causing him to freeze in place. His face rapidly turned a visible shade of crimson from bottom to top. Oh, Tom, are you okay? Before Bai Song could finish his sentence, Tom suddenly catapulted himself one meter into the air, his limbs and tail stretched out as he let out a loud, agonizing scream. Ay -ay -ay -ay. A tremendous, ear-piercing screech erupted, resembling the dive-bombing sound of a German Stuka bomber. Bai Song was startled by the enormous noise and almost went deaf from Tom's monstrous roar. Covering his ears with his hands, Bai Song quickly tried to calm Tom down. Stay calm, Tom. Take it easy. Finally, after approximately five seconds, the roar subsided. Once back on the ground, Tom immediately picked up his tail. However, just as he raised it, the tail snapped in the middle and hung limply. Tom could only look at his tail with a sense of sadness. Chapter 4, Summoning the Heroic Spirit. Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. In a dimly lit basement, two men were arranging something. Due to the excessive darkness, it was difficult to see what they were doing at first glance, but with the faint light of the surrounding candles, one could vaguely make out what seemed to be a silver magic circle on the ground, resembling some kind of occult ritual. If they were to arrange some offerings like severed heads or internal organs, it would truly resemble a scene from a cult. Everything needed for the summoning ritual is ready, Kiritsuga, confirmed one of the men elegantly named Tokiomi, who then approached the summoning circle. Seeing that Tokiomi seemed prepared to proceed with the summoning, the other man named Kaire stepped back a few steps. Finally, the time has come, and the holy relic is ready as well, Tokiomi smiled as he touched several holy marks on the back of his right hand, the timing is perfect too. He had been waiting for this day for far too long. As long as he could summon King Arthur, the heroic spirit, using this most precious holy relic, he would undoubtedly obtain the holy grail, and it would no longer be impossible to uncover the truth of the root. Nothing could go wrong. That was his evaluation of this summoning. Tokiomi calmly extended his right hand towards the silver summoning circle, while placing his left hand on his right forearm, and chanted loudly, Yeah first, O silver, O iron, O stone of the foundation, O archduke of the contract. Hear me in the name of our great teacher, the Archmagus Shwinorg. Let the descending winds be as a wall. Let the gates in all directions be shut, rising above the crown, and let the three forked roads to the kingdom revolve. I declare. Pure white radiance appeared on every line of the summoning circle, and at the same time, the holy marks on Tokyo Mi's right hand emitted a faint glow. Let thy body rest under my dominion, let my fate rest in thy blade. If thou submitteth to the call of the holy grail, and if thou wilt obey this mind, this reason, then thou shalt respond. I make my oath here. I am that person who is to become the virtue of all heaven. I am that person who is covered with the evil of all Hades. Thou seven heavens, clad in a trinity of words, come past they, restraining rings, and be thou the hands that protect the balance. At that moment, the white light suddenly intensified, engulfing the entire basement, causing the two present individuals to squint their eyes and unable to clearly see the situation before them. However, this beam of white light came and went quickly. Just two or three seconds later, the light disappeared without a trace. In the center of the summoning circle, a slender figure appeared. Servant Saber, I have come in response to the summoning, a golden-haired, blue-eyed girl clad in silver armor addressed Tokiomi, saying, tell me, are you my master? Tokiomi remained silent for a while as he looked at the girl before him. No matter how you looked at her, she had no connection whatsoever with the ancient king of heroes, Gilgamesh, right? He immediately glanced at his right hand, where the command seals had indeed appeared, indicating that this servant was indeed summoned by him. Casually, Tokiomi walked over to the stand where the holy relic was placed and grabbed the small box containing the relic. Upon opening it, he verified that it was indeed the oldest snakeskin in the world, the one he had prepared, without being tampered with. As he turned to look at Saber, who wore a perplexed expression, and then at the snakeskin in his hand, Tokiomi felt a sense of despair rise within him. Did I, buy a counterfeit? The same situation was unfolding elsewhere. Inside a certain castle in Germany, a man dressed in a black overcoat had just completed his summoning. As the dazzling light from the summoning circle gradually dissipated, a man with long white hair appeared before him, holding something resembling a staff in his hand. Kiritsugu, is this, King Arthur. Iris Veal, standing behind Kiritsugu, looked at the white-haired man summoned within the summoning circle, unsure. Regardless, she couldn't connect the person holding the staff before her with the legendary knight king, Arthur Pendragon. Before Kiritsugu could respond, the white-haired man spoke first, of course, I am not King Arthur. Then who are you? Kiritsugu asked, please introduce yourself. I am Merlin, also known as the Mage of Flowers, and I am the Merlin who assists King Arthur. Just call me Merlin, no need for formalities, said Merlin. 
With his right hand holding the staff, he tapped the ground, and a circle of radiant flowers blossomed at his feet. Did the summoning go wrong? I ended up summoning King Arthur's court magician, Kiritsugo took a puff of his cigarette and, looking at the bright side, thought, but it doesn't matter, as long as they can fight. Ahaha, this master sure loves to joke, Merlin laughed while casually rubbing the back of his head with his left hand, exuding extreme confidence. I'm not joking at all, apart from being excellent at running away and preserving my own life, I'm a complete waste when it comes to combat. Kiritsugo, can we return the servant? Hearing Merlin's carefree words, Iris Veal couldn't help but lean close to Kiritsugo's ear and ask softly, Returning to Fuyaki, by this time, the sky had completely darkened. And at this moment, Bai Song and Tom finally found a temporary base, or rather, a place to stay, which could be called a magical workshop to make it sound more impressive. It was a house that had been uninhabited for at least 20 years. Just observing it from the window gave off a rather eerie feeling, making one wonder if there were any ghosts living inside. However, Bai Song wasn't too bothered by it. After all, Bai Song had previously taken part-time jobs in haunted houses, so they weren't easily scared. And even if they did get scared, they had Tom to help them endure the horror, right? To be honest, Bai Song had initially planned to smash the window to get in. But before they could execute the plan, they suddenly remembered that Tom could probably squeeze through the door crack. Although Tom would temporarily turn into a flat shape, they would return to normal as soon as the scene changed. However, when Tom heard this request, they immediately became timid. Hey, Tom, why are you clinging to my leg? Bai Song looked at Tom, who had both hands, feet, and tail wrapped around their lower leg, looking utterly confused. Bai Song tried to pull Tom down with their hands, but it had no effect. Instead, Tom's limbs turned into soft tentacles like an octopus, coiling around Bai Song's leg like a rope. Chapter 5, Haunted. Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. Even Tom began to tremble all over, with a high intensity of shaking. Ignoring the fact that he was a living being, Bai Song felt as if he had tied a massager to his leg, shaking it to the point of numbness. Compared to the fearless Tom who had bravely faced Ryuanosuk, whose size far surpassed his own, they were like two completely different cats. If being tough didn't work, then they had to try a softer approach. It's okay, trust me, we just need to go in and open a door. Saying that, Bai Song patted Tom's head, trying to calm down this frightened cat for some unknown reason. After you go in, all you need to do is open the door. Don't be afraid, and even if there are ghosts, you'll be fine, right? When Tom heard Bai Song's first sentence, he had already managed to calm down a bit. He even slightly loosened his grip on Bai Song's legs. However, just a few seconds later, Bai Song's uncertain words directly scared Tom to the core again. The entire cat turned white. Yes, he was truly frightened, a whiteout kind of fright. If one had to describe it, it was as if someone had poured a bucket of white paint on him, completely draining the color from the cat. After a few seconds, Tom's color gradually returned. He vigorously shook his head at Bai Song, with such speed and amplitude that Bai Song could feel a gust of cold wind. Well, there's no other choice. I originally planned to use the saved rent money to buy you cake and milk, but it's a pity. Saying that, Bai Song pretended to walk outside, moving slowly to give Tom some time to think. This was just talk, after all. He was a person with no legal status, and yet he managed to find a haunted house to rent. Moreover, even if he had a legal residence, he still couldn't afford a house. The only reason was that Ryunashuk's wallet was too empty. Perhaps Ryunashuk had money somewhere else, but it was no longer relevant. Since he didn't know how to deal with Ryunashuk, should he kill him? But Bai Song couldn't bring himself to do it. Should he let him go? That would be like releasing a tiger back to the mountain. In the end, he could only rely on Tom, who seemed to be able to produce Ryunashuk from a four-dimensional space. In the beginning, Tom carried Ryunashuk, but as they went further, Bai Song was surprised to find that Ryunashuk had disappeared. However, when he asked Tom, it could still be retrieved as if it existed in a four-dimensional space. At this point, Bai Song was just teasing Tom since he had no other options. If Tom didn't respond, Bai Song would have to smash the window. In any case, Bai Song had settled in this house. Tom couldn't sit still anymore. The thought of losing the food that was about to be his was unbearable. No, it absolutely couldn't happen. The difference between being full and being hungry, he understood it well. After realizing this, Tom immediately let go of Bai Song's leg. His eyes instantly became sharp, and he decided to go inside and open the door. Feeling the relief in his lightly shaken legs, Bai Song knew that his previous provocation had succeeded. He turned around and saw that Tom was already adorned with armor he had somehow found. He had a small pot on his head as a helmet, held a trash can lid as a shield in his left hand, and wielded a frying spatula as a defensive weapon in his right hand. With a proud and determined stride, Tom headed towards the door. However, the closer he got to the entrance, the more his body shrank and the more uncertain he became. When he reached the door, Tom took a deep breath. His upper body squeezed through the door crack and his lower body ran outside, trying to squeeze his entire body through the gap. Soon, he made it inside. Once inside, Tom immediately began surveying his surroundings. Everywhere he looked, there were spider webs, giving a creepy and eerie vibe, but there didn't seem to be any ghosts. However, just as Tom let out a sigh of relief and prepared to turn around and open the door, he caught a glimpse, from the corner of his eye, of a floating white figure at the end of the corridor. 
Its eyes even emitted an eerie red light. If Tom could speak now, he would definitely shout in fright. Wow, it's a real apparition. Percent dollar and percent carrot percent and dollar percent and in an instant of shock, Tom abandoned his equipment and let out a scream before leaping up and clinging to the ceiling with his claws, trembling. The apparition, upon seeing Tom, hardly hesitated and prepared to fly towards him. However, before it could make a move, a mid-length haired girl dressed in a blue kimono with a red coat over it appeared behind the apparition. With a flash of a blade, the apparition was instantly cut in half, its spirit dissolving and disappearing from this world. With that, the last ghost here has been dealt with. Seriously, what kind of world have I been dragged into? The number of ghosts here is just too exaggerated. Hmm. Just as the girl was about to wrap things up, she suddenly noticed a light blue cat hanging above the doorway. What the heck, just a cat. But why would there be a living cat here? Although she found the cat a bit strange, the girl didn't pay much attention to it. After she sheathed her small knife, she opened the window and left the house. After Tom, who had observed everything from the ceiling, confirmed that the apparition had disappeared, he quickly jumped down and opened the door. Then he pounced on Bison like a hungry tiger, continuing to tremble. Seeing Tom burst out of the door, Bison immediately started questioning him, what was that scream all about just now? As soon as Tom entered, he suddenly screamed, giving Bison, who was outside keeping watch, a big fright. Just as Bison was about to crouch down and observe the situation inside through the door crack, Tom jumped out directly. Upon hearing Bison's words, Tom jumped down from him, his hands pulling the corners of his mouth to reveal his sharp teeth. He then raised his hands like claws and waved them in front of him. Next, Tom picked up his frying spatula and swung it into the air in front of him. He then threw the spatula aside and returned to the spot where he had swung it, continuing to act like a ghost. He placed his hands over his heart and leaned forward. With that, Tom's dual role pantomime performance came to an end. So, you're saying there was an apparition inside, and you defeated it with a single swipe of your spatula. Bai Song struggled to comprehend Tom's actions. Tom was about to shake his head, but then he thought to himself, if he let his new owner believe that he had handled the situation, wouldn't that mean a bigger cake for him later? So he immediately nodded, proudly raising his head and straightening his body. He placed his left hand on his waist and used his right hand to give a thumbs up to his own chest. Seeing Tom nod, Bai Song's eyes lit up, and he immediately raised his thumb, exclaiming, Oh, Tom, well done. Chapter 6, I Summon Myself? Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. Although Bai Song was initially very confident in Tom's combat power, he hasn't witnessed any battles firsthand, except for beating Ryuanosuk. Moreover, as shown in the animation, Tom's combat power is extremely unstable. He always has the upper hand throughout the entire fight, but in the end, Jerry ends up winning. There are many cases like this, quite the opposite, in fact. For Bai Song, learning that Tom can defeat Ghost is undoubtedly very good news. Upon entering the house, Bai Song immediately noticed a strong musty smell. The whole house seemed somewhat damp, and even the wooden floor in the entrance had a large hole, almost the size of a bowl. Considering that this old house hadn't been inhabited for at least 20 years, this situation was already considered quite good. Bai Song didn't have any complaints about the house. If you were to ask why, it could only be said that compared to the dormitory Bai Song lived in during high school, this house was much better. That kind of living environment that made dogs shed tears and made Lu Yuxi delete the poem Lu Ming after seeing it, Bai Song lived in it for a full three years. Even today, Bai Song still remembers the first time he entered the dormitory and found someone had written thank you on the corridor, which was terrifying. Compared to the dormitory in high school, this old house, which was far superior in terms of living conditions, was naturally not disliked by Bai Song at all. After tidying up the living room a bit and clearing a place to settle down, Bai Song sat on the floor and took out a flashlight, a local map, and a comic book from the plastic bag he had been carrying. Tonight, Bai Song didn't plan on sleeping too early. Instead, he intended to study the map and roughly determine the locations of the other masters, relying on his memories from watching anime to make educated guesses. As for the comic book, it was for Tom's entertainment. In case there was another ghostly incident, Tom would be the only one capable of fighting. So Tom absolutely couldn't fall asleep. Besides, the Holy Grail War also starts at night. It would be best to let Tom sleep during the day. If Tom starts feeling drowsy at night, then it would be disastrous. Bai Song was well aware that Tom's drowsiness couldn't be suppressed. Instead of letting Tom doze off without anything to do, it would be better to find something for him to pass the time. By tomorrow morning, Bai Song planned to go out and visit various key locations, such as the Mata household, the Tosaka household, and the Emiya residence. As is well known, in a Holy Grail War, excluding the Great Holy Grail War in Romania, the Fifth Holy Grail War, the American Holy Grail War, and a bunch of exceptions, usually, it consists of seven masters and seven servants. And he probably occupies one of the master positions. Afterward, he still needs to observe how many masters there are in this Holy Grail War. The possibility that the Fourth Holy Grail War had also turned out to be an abnormal Holy Grail War, with himself as an additional master, could not be ruled out, and, to be honest, Bai Song felt that this was more likely. The reason was that his own follower Tom's job title was not one of the seven servant classes, but a separate Tom servant classes, and the ability values were simply all question marks. 
So most likely there would be eight masters this time, with myself as the extra one, but there was no need to think too much about it now, the number of masters would always be clarified later, what was more important now was the investigation during the day, and Fuyaki City was only a small city, it wouldn't be difficult to find these places in a day's time, not to mention that it was with a map, it was simply a matter of having feet. In the meantime, he'd have to take advantage of the little time he had this evening to do some good work on what he was going to do next, and on that panel. While Bai Song stayed up late looking at the map, a young boy named Waver confirmed that both elderly people in his family were asleep before sneaking out of the house. The command seals on the back of his right hand indicated that he was also one of the chosen participants in the Fourth Holy Grail War. Once he summons his servant, the command seals will transform into command spells. Unlike wealthy individuals like Kiritsugu and Tokiomi, Weber didn't use mercury for his summoning circle, he simply used a few random chickens and planned to use their blood to draw the summoning circle. Compared to others, Waver's summoning circle seemed a bit shabby. However, for Waver, who had borrowed money from his classmates for the travel expenses to Japan, being able to participate in the war was already good enough. What more could he ask for? After placing the holy relic he had stolen from his teacher in front of the summoning circle, Waver nervously stretched out his right hand and began his summoning ritual. Let thy body rest under my dominion, let my fate rest in thy blade. If thou submittest to the call of the holy grail, and if thou wilt obey this mind, this reason, then thou shalt respond. I make my oath here. I am that person who is to become the virtue of all heaven. I am that person who is covered with the evil of all Hades. Thou seven heavens, clad in a trinity of words, come past they, restraining rings, and be thou the hands that protect the balance. After the final chant, a brief but dazzling light erupted from the summoning circle. When the light dissipated, two figures appeared within the summoning circle. Ha! Huh. Looking at the summoned servants, Weber couldn't maintain his balance and ended up sitting on the ground, staring blankly at the two figures in the summoning circle. Two. Servants. This was different from what he had read in the books. If he remembered correctly, a master should only have one servant, right? In the summoning circle, there were two men, one tall and one short. The shorter one was dressed in red attire with a matching cape, but the only downside was that he was really short, around five feet one inch or so, and had a face that resembled a young boy. Well, to be fair, Waver himself was only five feet two inches. As for the other one, it was a bit outrageous. He was dressed in a modern style suit, even holding a cigar in his right hand. Weber really wanted to comment on whether this was truly a servant, but it didn't seem like the right atmosphere to say such things. I am the son of Zeus, Alexander, or you can call me Alexander III. You must be my master, right? The young boy in red opened his arms first and boldly said to Waver. Seems like it. Although Weber was confused about summoning two servants, he still nodded. My name is Waver Velvet. Afterward, Weber looked at the tall man in the outrageous suit and asked, And you? Are you also a servant? The tall man in the suit stared at Weber with an incredulous expression upon being summoned. It wasn't until Weber asked that he adjusted his mindset and coughed slightly. Excuse me? Yes, I am indeed a servant. My name is Zaj Kongming. Chapter 7, Waver, I feel like I've been deceived by the panel. Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. Zaj. Kongming. Waver dusted off his bottom and extended his neck, wearing a face of distrust that was practically screaming. If there was a question mark hovering over his head, it would have been perfect. Are you sure? With that said, Waver scrutinized the man who claimed to be Kongming once again. However, no matter how he looked at it, this was undeniably a true blue Englishman, right? Except for his slightly long hair, everything about him screamed England. Even more so, this so-called Kong Ming spoke with a London accent. If he wanted to deceive him, couldn't he at least speak in Chinese? It's like he's taking him for a fool. And for some reason, Waver had this nagging feeling that he was familiar with this tall man in the suit, as if they had known each other for a long time. But Waver couldn't recall where he had encountered such a person. In the end, he could only attribute it to the brain's classic optical illusion, where the brain lazily processes present information and assumes that what it encounters is something already known. If he wasn't mistaken, Kong Ming should be a figure from the Far East around 1,800 years ago. Yet, the person before him was dressed in a suit that emerged in modern times. No matter how he thought about it, it had absolutely nothing to do with the Far East from 1,800 years ago, right? Unless Kong Ming wasn't a person from 1,800 years ago but rather someone from the year 1,800 AD. I understand your doubts, but there's no need to worry. You just need to know that I am Kong Ming, said Kong Ming, taking a puff from the cigar held in his right hand. Anyway, in this holy grail war, I am your servant. Isn't that enough to know? But, that's enough, isn't it? Kong Ming interrupted Waver, speaking firmly. After much hesitation, Waver finally nodded. Um, okay. On the second day, in the morning, Bai Song walking on the street repeatedly attracted the attention of the people around. After all, if there was a cat wrapped around his neck at all times, it would definitely be eye-catching. Originally, he wanted Tom to walk with him, but unfortunately, Tom didn't seem to be accustomed to walking on all fours all the time. As they walked, he stood up and walked alongside Bai Song. To be honest, for the average person, this kind of thing was quite creepy. Then Bai Song tried carrying Tom while walking. It was even better this way. As they walked, Bai Song noticed that Tom was being pulled longer and longer by the force of gravity. 
By the time Bai Song realized it, Tom's lower body had already turned into a rope that was 20 meters long. It could be coiled up into a whole bundle of cats. It was really difficult to handle. Fortunately, there was no one around at that time, otherwise, it would have been troublesome. None of the methods worked, and he couldn't leave Tom behind either, otherwise, Bai Song himself would feel very unsafe. After all, if we set aside Tom, who was a powerful fighter, even calling Bai Song a weakling would be an insult, encountering danger would definitely result in a game over. So, in conclusion, Bai Song finally chose to use Tom wrapped around his neck like a scarf. Surprisingly, it was quite warm, except that Tom kept moving around, making Bai Song's neck itchy, but other than that, there weren't many other disadvantages. Bai Song originally planned to wake up a little earlier, but unfortunately, his biological clock seemed to be fixed, just like before he traveled through time. He slept until 11 o'clock before waking up. Moreover, it wasn't him who woke up on his own, it was mainly because of Tom's sleeping posture. He actually kicked in his sleep and kicked him in the forehead. It was quite painful, even if it was just a cat's kick. But thinking back to when Tom's arm didn't move, and he only swung his hand holding a big stick, and knocked down Ryunashuk, after thinking about it, everything seemed normal again. If it weren't for that, he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to wake up until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Although in a certain sense, Tom was indeed responsible for this, the experience of being awakened by a kick early in the morning was obviously not very pleasant, and now Bai Song felt a buzzing sensation in his head. But all these things were not important. What was important was that he realized that this world, seemed to be different from what he had imagined. First of all, he was very certain that the Fifth Holy Grail War took place in 2004, and the Fourth Holy Grail War happened 10 years before that, in 1994. However, why does everyone here have a smartphone in their hands? Looking up, you could see various large screens. And on specific streets, there were maid cafe employees dressed as maids doing promotions? The current Bai Song felt like Lu Lai Lao entering the Grand View Garden. It's not that he hasn't seen these things before, he definitely has. But the crucial point is where he saw them. Seeing them in a modern city is very normal, so normal that not having these things feels strange. However, it's different in 1994. Back then, mobile phones were bulky, not these large screen smartphones. Now Bai Song feels the only word to describe it is absurd. All the confusion persisted until Bai Song, at the cost of being mistaken for a fool by passersby, asked a random person, what year is it today? Only then did he get an answer. However, this result left Bai Song even more perplexed. It is now 2012, a full 18 years after the Fourth Holy Grail War in the normal timeline. Forget about the Fourth Holy Grail War, theoretically, the Fifth Holy Grail War should have been completed, and in two years, the Holy Grail should be dismantled. So, it's 18 years later, but a new question arises, if it's 18 years later, why does the Ryunashuk he encountered still look like he's in his 20s? Tom, do you think we've been deceived? Bai Song couldn't help but feel a sense of desolation as he recalled the clear line on the panel that said Fourth Holy Grail War and gently stroked Tom wrapped around his neck. Tom could only shrug his shoulders and raise his hands, as if saying, how would I, a cat, understand what you're talking about? Seeing this, Bai Song had no choice but to continue his investigation in Fuyaki City. No matter what he would do next, gathering information was crucial, especially in the current situation where he knew the timeline was completely off. Previously, he had determined the locations of the Tosaka and Mata families since their mansions were quite conspicuous. There was no need to search, he could ask passersby pretending to be a tourist to find out the exact locations. However, the Emiya residence, that one was truly elusive. There were many houses in that area that looked similar to the Emiya residence, so if you really wanted to find it, you would have to search blindly. Meanwhile, as Bai Song was conducting investigations throughout Fuyaki City, a plane from Germany landed smoothly on the runway of Fuyaki Airport. Chapter 8, The Scum Among Scum, Merlin. Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. A white-haired woman with crimson eyes stepped out of the plane and sighed as she looked at the distant scenery. Her face had a slight blush. Finally, we've arrived. Karitsugu's hometown. This person is Iris Veal, the woman who was next to Karitsugu when he summoned the servants. She is also Karitsugu's wife. This trip could be considered her first time traveling far from home, no. It could even be said that it's her first time leaving the castle in the snow. Her entire eight years of life were spent inside that castle, so she appears quite excited. Don't you want to tweet about this? I can take some pictures for you, a white-haired man shouted from behind her, sucking on a lollipop. Following closely behind Iris, he also emerged from the cabin of the plane. He is Merlin, the servant summoned by Karitsugu. However, unlike when he was initially summoned, Merlin is now dressed in casual clothes, resembling a tourist on a vacation in Japan. He even brought a digital camera, which he had requested from Karitsugu before departure. After speaking to Iris, Merlin took out a camera from his bag and gestured to take a few pictures of her. Let's not do that, as soon as Iris heard Merlin's words, her previous sense of wonder vanished without a trace. We are here to participate in the Holy Grail War. We can't create trouble for Karitsugu. With that said, Iris swiftly walked down the stairs. Throughout the entire journey, Merlin's influence on her went from being the mysterious magician she had read about in the legend of King Arthur before his summoning to her astonishment after his summoning, and now to the realization that he is a scum of a person. 
Merlin managed to accomplish this level of impression destruction in just a 12-hour flight. Perhaps Merlin can be considered a genius in this aspect. For some reason, Merlin couldn't stop talking on the plane. If it were just his loquaciousness, it wouldn't be a problem. Iris herself enjoys engaging in conversations with people. However, the issue is that no matter what topic they discuss, Merlin always manages to hit the exact sensitive points in Alice's heart. It's as if out of hundreds of roads, Merlin is particularly fond of the one that's filled with landmines, and he steps on every single one of them as if he's stepping on floor tiles. If he had avoided detonating dozens of landmines or fewer kinky moments during their 12-hour conversation, perhaps Iris's impression of Merlin could have been slightly better. For instance, when he was praising Iris's beauty and suddenly started saying, it's a pity that humans have limitations. Life is short, with only a few decades to live, and homunculus have an even shorter lifespan. Madam, your time is running out, isn't it? What a shame. Although Iris could hear the sincerity in Merlin's words, the next moment he would cheerfully say something completely different, which was quite outrageous. Originally, she had an admiration for the characters in mythological legends, but now that she had actually encountered a figure from those legends, for some reason, that admiration instantly shattered. If someone were to mention Merlin or the legend of King Arthur to her now, she might not show any outward signs of displeasure, but internally, she would definitely have a disappointed expression like oh no, oh well, if that's the case, the significance of the camera I prepared is diminished. Can't we take at least one picture? Merlin said. Upon hearing this, Merlin smiled and casually took a few selfies. Then he immediately caught up with Iris's pace. Once again, Iris resolutely refused Merlin's suggestion. No need. I would be grateful if you just stay vigilant and watch our surroundings. Well, filtering out that kind of stuff is easy for me. After all, I have clairvoyance. Unless there's powerful magic blocking my perception, I can easily see through it, Merlin proudly said, pointing to his eyes. Though even if it's blocked, I can still forcibly see through it, but that would definitely expose us. Merlin valued his clairvoyant abilities quite highly. After all, during the thousands of years he was imprisoned in the tower, he passed the time by peeping at the world using those all-seeing eyes. Apart from that, his greatest interest might be catfishing people online with a female persona. It's surprising, but it's truly amusing. For example, there was that fan named Ichiban when he was streaming under a female identity. It could be said that Ichiban was his die-hard fan. The gifts just kept pouring in. Most people would feel some embarrassment in such a situation, but not Merlin. Watching Merlin taking pictures everywhere on the street, Iris felt a bit helpless. I know that, but are you sure you don't want to establish a workshop right now? The Holy Grail War officially begins tonight, and for a mage, it's dangerous without a magical workshop, isn't it? As for safety, you don't have to worry. As long as you stay by my side, you'll be in a completely safe state. Saying that, Merlin proudly lifted his head and patted his chest, filled with pride. I can't guarantee my fighting abilities, but when it comes to preserving my own life and running away, I'm definitely a top-notch servant. Iris heard Merlin's words, but she had doubts in her heart. When she asked about Merlin's actual combat abilities before, he actually said, I'm not good at magic at all. You see, if I chant too quickly, I might bite my tongue, right? It's better for me to fight with a sword. After that, Iris gave up asking about his combat abilities. Oh, look ahead, there's a game arcade. As soon as the previous sentence was out of Merlin's mouth, his eyes suddenly lit up. He pointed forward and said to Iris, I've been wanting to try it for a long time. Indeed, when in Japan, we must experience the game arcades here. Ah, wait, Iris tried to stop Merlin's slacking off, but it was of no use. Helplessly, Iris followed Merlin towards the direction of the game arcade. As soon as they took a few steps, Bai Song happened to arrive in the vicinity. Just as Bai Song was passing by, suddenly, the tom hanging around his neck made a slight movement. Tom's tail, without any warning, straightened out and shot up into the air. Then, the white fur at the very end of the tail started rapidly flickering with red lights. Beep beep beep, beep beep beep, beep beep beep. While the tail was flashing, a voice came from Tom's mouth, indicating the detection of an enemy. Tom, what's wrong? Bai Song was familiar with the street, but Tom's sudden actions near his ear startled him. Tom didn't say anything. He just straightened his tail with a serious expression on his face and pointed towards the game arcade not far away. Chapter 9, Bai Song, case closed, she's a master? Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. Although I'm not entirely sure about Tom's exact meaning, but considering his unusual behavior. Oh, sorry, that's actually quite normal for Tom. Anyway, Tom must have noticed something, and it's highly likely that it's an enemy. Following the direction indicated by Tom's tail, Bai Song looked over and coincidentally saw the backs of two people with long white hair entering the game arcade, one male and one female. Are those two participants in the Holy Grail War? If they are, then nod your head, Bai Song asked Tom, but he had only seen their backs as they entered and didn't have a chance to observe if they had command seals. Unfortunately, the two individuals disappeared from Bai Song's sight, so he had no choice but to lower his head and ask Tom, who was wrapped around his neck. Both of those individuals had silver hair. As far as Bai Song could recall, there was definitely no such combination in the Fourth Holy Grail War. Apart from Alice Phil pretending to be a saber master, there wasn't even a single person with silver hair. 
Now, with these two individuals in front of him, both with silver hair, it clearly indicated that they were a new combination of masters and servants from outside the original storyline. Upon hearing Bai Song's question, Tom's brain suddenly crashed. He could identify the male, but he didn't have that feeling about the female. Should he nod or shake his head? In the end, Tom chose the Indian way of nodding, swinging his head from side to side like a pendulum. So, I'll take it as a yes. Bai Song looked at Tom, who was shaking his head, and fell silent for a while. He was somewhat at a loss, unsure whether they were or weren't. But Bai Song was certain that those two individuals were participants in the Holy Grail War. After all, in the dark and brutal Fourth Holy Grail War, he remembered clearly that most of the people he encountered along the way had black hair, at most red or brown hair. Suddenly encountering two individuals with long white hair, it was impossible for Bai Song to believe that something was not amiss. At the same time, Tom, being his own servant, also had a reaction. When the two factors were combined, Bai Song wouldn't believe that these two were not participants in the Holy Grail War. Let's go inside and take a look, Bai Song casually took off his coat and held it in his right hand to cover the command seals on the back of his hand. Then, he cautiously entered the arcade. However, just as Bai Song reached the entrance, he was immediately stopped by a staff member. The staff pointed to a piece of paper posted at the door and said, Sir, it's prohibited to bring cats inside. Oh, this. Bai Song pointed at the paper. This is not a cat, it's just a stuffed toy. I won it from a lottery over there. See, it's quite flexible. To make the staff member believe, Bai Song pulled on Tom's paw, and it extended over a meter long. Obviously, this was something that normal creatures on Earth couldn't do. Tom cooperated by slowly retracting his paw like a wound-up toy, all while emitting a laugh that no cat could produce, ho ho ha ha ha. Once the paw was completely retracted, Tom immediately pretended to have a vacant expression, resembling a genuine doll. Oh, it's not. I'm very sorry, please come in, the staff member quickly stepped aside, allowing Bai Song to enter. The claw machine in that shop can actually give out such fantastic dolls? I'll get one after work. After Bai Song entered, the staff member's eyes were filled with excitement as they looked towards the shop across the street. That stuffed toy was already a must-have for them. Upon entering the store, Bai Song immediately began searching for the two white-haired individuals. It was quite easy to spot them since the two with silver hair didn't require any deliberate searching. They were already within Bai Song's line of sight. Approaching quietly at a closer distance, Bai Song pretended to watch others play games while secretly peeping at them. Although the distance was relatively close, about 5 meters, it was unlikely that he would be noticed. After all, he was just an ordinary person with no magical abilities, and even if those two people realized he was watching them, it probably wouldn't matter much, as many others were glancing in their direction. The two people, a man and a woman, both had silver hair, but their styles of dress were significantly different. The man wore an outfit resembling that of a traveler, with a camera hanging around his neck. It was evident that he was a modern person. The woman, on the other hand, dressed coldly, entirely in white, and seemed overwhelmed by the noise of the game arcade. Additionally, there was no command seal on her right hand. Bai Song quickly made a preliminary determination. The man was likely the master, and the woman was clearly his servant. Furthermore, the man wore gloves on both hands, undoubtedly to conceal his command seals. Hmm? Red eyes. Just as Bai Song was preparing to change position, the woman happened to turn her head and say something to the silver-haired man. From his angle, Bai Song had a clear view of the woman's eyes. Red eyes. Red eyes, let me think. It might be Tomo Gozen? She looks a bit like her. There are several white-haired characters in the Fate series, but when it comes to white hair and red eyes, the options are limited. Besides Mary, Proto Merlin, Bai Song only knows one other character with red eyes, and that's Tomo Gozen. However, it's highly unlikely that the woman Bai Song saw was Melty. Her demeanor was completely off. After a brief confirmation, Bai Song quietly left the game arcade. If he wanted to hear what they were saying in such a noisy place, he would have to get closer, but that would also increase the risk of being discovered. In that case, it wouldn't be worth the potential consequences. After a short while of browsing, Bai Song had already found a master and servant pair. It couldn't be called a windfall, but it was certainly a satisfactory outcome. Even if there were no other discoveries for the rest of the day, Bai Song would be content. I'm telling you, this place seems dangerous no matter how you look at it, said Iris, looking at Merlin, who was already immersed in the game. Although she also wanted to play, there was a time and place for it, and the Holy Grail War was about to begin as night fell. Initially, she thought Merlin was just joking when he said he was useless except for self-preservation, but after witnessing him in action in Fuyaki, she realized he wasn't lying. He truly was unreliable. Don't worry, as long as I'm here, and unless something unexpected happens, I'll be the first to run if there's an enemy. Oh, by the way, I'll definitely bring you along, Merlin reassured her and continued tempting her. Come on, let's play. It's really fun. Gore. Fine, but just one game, Iris reluctantly agreed, swallowing her saliva. She glanced at her left hand to check the time and noticed that it was still early, so she decided to give it a try. Unbeknownst to them, night had quietly fallen. Chapter 10, How Did the Dragon Face Lose? Type Moon, but the servant is Tom. Tn, maybe some help I don't know what it mean. Nightfall. For ordinary workers in Fuyaki, it symbolized liberation. 
but for the participants of the Holy Grail War, nightfall meant that the war had finally begun in earnest. However, it was only the first day of the Holy Grail War, and even if there were any battles, they would surely be hastily resolved. No one would be foolish enough to reveal all their cards right from the start. Regardless, Bai Song was prepared early on. After taking a short nap in the afternoon, he set off. While Bai Song could be considered a nocturnal creature with abundant energy at night, it was still good to get some rest. Plus, the main reason was to let Tom sleep a little longer. Bai Song knew the consequences of Tom being tired. He would simply take a few steps and fall asleep immediately. It was a bit terrifying to think about, even if they encountered a servant or a mage. It would be effortless for them to eliminate Bai Song. He had great confidence in his own combat abilities, but he knew very well that he couldn't defeat anyone in the entire Holy Grail War. It's so quiet, and there aren't many people on the streets. Walking along the riverbank of the Mayan River, Bai Song couldn't spot a single living soul. There were some people walking by the river earlier, but as he continued towards the mouth of the river, the number of people decreased until there was no one left. It was for the best, as Tom could walk freely without Bai Song having to carry him around his neck all the time. To be honest, it was fine at first, but as time went on, it became increasingly uncomfortable. Bai Song's neck was drenched in sweat. As for why he was aimlessly wandering near the Mayan River, it was because two famous battles from the original story took place there. The first was the duel between Saber and Lancer at the harbor near the mouth of the Mayan River. The second was the confrontation with Castor in the middle of the Mayan River. As for this so-called Fourth Holy Grail War with who knows which participants, Bai Song was completely clueless. He could only rely on luck by coming here. In the original story, this was the time when he attracted servants to engage in battles with him, but at the moment, nothing seemed to be happening. At least Tom hadn't sensed anything yet. Sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. Suddenly, a crackling sound of electricity cut through the sky. What's that commotion? Startled by the sound, Bai Song quickly looked around, but he didn't see anything. It was only when Tom pointed towards the sky that Bai Song noticed a faint streak of lightning tearing across the firmament. If you didn't look carefully, it would be difficult to notice. It was undoubtedly a servant, and it was highly likely to be Iskandar. If that's the case, it would be great. It would mean that even though the timeline is messed up, perhaps some of the characters can still match up. This way, I can regain that advantage of understanding the characters. Seeing the situation, Bai Song immediately wanted to go over and take a look. Unfortunately, the thing was flying too fast, and he couldn't reach the scene in time on his two legs. Tom, let's go, let's go and see. With that said, Bai Song picked up Tom and tucked him under his arm, running towards the direction of the lightning streak. However, before Bai Song could run more than a few dozen meters, Tom, who had been carried in a slightly uncomfortable position, suddenly broke free and leaped onto the ground. Then, with much greater speed than Bai Song, Tom lifted him up and dashed towards the direction where the lightning had disappeared. Bai Song ran for a while and suddenly realized that he was being carried by Tom instead. He looked down, utterly bewildered. A few minutes earlier, in the backyard of a residential house in the Fuyaki residential area. Inside the house, Waver was observing the images sent back by his familiar that he had released. Suddenly, he heard the sound of thunder coming from the backyard. Looking through the window, he realized that Alexander had slipped out at some point and even summoned his war horse. Waver quickly opened the window and called out to Alexander in a low voice, Wait, Ryder, where are you going? Hmm? Of course, I'm going to battle. Alexander, who had just summoned his warhorse, Bucephalus, in the backyard, was about to mount and reply to Waver's question. Nonsense. I know you're going out, but why did you run out like this? And you're making such a grand entrance. Isn't this the Holy Grail War? I'm going to participate in the battle, of course. Alexander tilted his head, as if wondering why Waver would ask such a question. Then, with a swift movement, he mounted the horse. I am destined to become a great hero like Achilles. How could I not fight during the war? Seeing Alexander about to ride off, Waver became extremely anxious. Huh? I can't understand what you're thinking. The Holy Grail War is not some gladiatorial contest. Stop right there and don't run. He had initially thought that in the Holy Grail War, there would only be seven servants in total, but he had managed to command two servants himself, Ryder and Castor. This advantage was truly extraordinary, and he couldn't help but feel invincible. How could he lose with Ryder mounting Bucephalus? He had planned to prove himself in front of his colleagues and teachers at the clock tower once he obtained the Holy Grail. However, this advantage was now jeopardized by one of his own servants going rogue, something Waver couldn't accept. Zudge Liang, who was standing nearby, approached Waver from behind and patted his shoulder. What's the matter? Aren't you going? Upon hearing, Waver who considering using command spells, was momentarily stunned, but quickly understood the situation. Huh? Why should I go? No, I should say, why is he going? What? Are you going too? Zudge Liang feigned surprise for a moment, then turned to Alexander outside the window and said, Ryder, Waver says he wants to join you in the expedition. Using his innate skill military tactics A+, Zudge Liang had already predicted that Waver would be completely safe on this outing. His A+, level skill allowed him to predict unexpected events with absolute certainty. To counter this skill, one would need an equally high level of luck. 
Besides, Zhuge Liang felt a stomachache every time he saw Waver's current idiotic expression, so it would be a good opportunity to throw him into the mix and let him toughen up a bit. After all, nothing serious would happen. Before Waver could react to what was happening, Zhuge Liang grabbed him by the back of his collar and threw him out the window towards Alexander. What are you doing? Ah, 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 ah. Huh? Really? Master, I never expected you to be a warrior too. Excellent. You truly deserve to be my master. Alexander casually caught Waver as he was thrown down and placed him behind him. Without waiting for Waver to refuse, Alexander pulled the reins and soared into the sky. What the hell is going on?